Hello, my name is Richard Caldwell. I live and work in Birmingham in the United Kingdom and I'm going to talk in this video about listening, decoding, in use. And this is the first of four videos and this is the introduction. I was to have given a workshop at the IATEFL conference in Manchester and it was to have been my last as an active member of the ELT profession. So, as the IATEFL conference was cancelled, I cannot do that. So it's a shame that I won't be giving the workshop in front of an audience. But I have decided to turn some of the content into four short YouTube videos with handouts and worksheets available on the Speech in Action website which is www.speechinaction.org. So this is the first of the four videos, the introduction. The other three will be about specific instances of decoding difficulty and how we should treat them. In the next video, it will be about consonant death. Uh, following that, there'll be one on the polar risk, the case of can't and can't, and then the last one will be on the hiss effect. Central to all my work, and I will keep coming back to this point because English language teaching in general, course book authors, teacher trainers, and the applied linguists who inform us, who give academic information to the ELT profession, do not get this point. There are different goals for listening and pronunciation. The goals for mastery are different. Our goal as teachers of listening is to help our learners understand fast, messy, authentic speech, which is much more varied and unpredictable than what they need to produce in order to be intelligible. So that's from Southamurthia et al, 2010. So that's a decade ago, and we don't get it. We still don't get it. So listening decoding, in the sense that I'm going to use it, is the process of recognising words in the stream of speech as it speeds past your ears. And the reference there is to um, my most recent book, A Syllabus for Listening. So listening decoding is about recognising words in the sound substance. So in teaching listening, we are using the wrong tools. The methods we use for the goals of clarity and intelligibility in pronunciation work are worse than useless for teaching listening. Worse than useless! So, if you look towards the top of the image, that scribbly scrabbly mess is the varied, unpredictable, everyday speech that our learners have to listen to and decode. And at, towards the bottom of the image is the person who represents the ELT profession who is knitting a very neat and ordered um, garment which is the clear and intelligible model of speech. So at the top we have something that's varied and unpredictable and at the bottom, we have something that's stable, regular and predictable. But, but learners increasingly are telling us that they are bamboozled when it comes to real life listening. And indeed, even in classroom listening, a cheerful class can often be reduced to frowning unhappiness when the recording is played and the listening task starts in earnest. So I mentioned sound substance previously. If we could see the sound substance, it might look something like this. Smudged, unclear, and that's, that is the norm that expert speakers can cope with. Here is what it actually sounds like. They said, uh... Right, we don't have a technology teacher. We don't have any technology teachers. So, um, so now you're head of technology. 
for the entire school of about 1,500 pupils. Uh, <laughs> and we don't have any equipment to do technology. And this is what it looks like when written down. They said, uh, right, we don't have a technology teacher. We don't have any technology teachers. So, um, so now you're head of technology. <laughs> For the entire school of about 1,500 pupils. Uh, <laughs> and we don't have any equipment to do technology. The sight substance of language, its written form, dominates language teaching. And this domination results in the neglect of the sound substance. We need to treat the two substances as entirely separate dimensions, both of which we must teach. Teaching listening decoding is about teaching the sound substance of language. We must teach the mushiness, the mess, the unpredictability that is the normal state of everyday normal speech in English of whatever type. We must teach the sound substance of language. And must, we must teach the relationship between the sound substance of language and its sort of messiness and the tidy version of the sight substance that currently is all we do. So it's the relationship between the smudgy mush on the left and the, the tidy, sight-friendly sight substance on the right of this slide. So if we compare the two substances, the sound substance is invisible it goes at the speaker's pace and it's uninspectable. In normal listening circumstances, you cannot call up a visual version of the speech that is zooming past your ears. It's uninspectable. Whereas the sight substance is visible, it goes at the reader's pace, you can control your speed of encounter with the sight substance and it's inspectable. You can go back to it and uh, look up a word and work out the meaning. You cannot do that with the sound substance. So where should the teaching of the sound substance happen? Should it happen in supplementary textbooks, in main course textbooks, in the teacher's skill set? So the teacher does it through activities and it's a skill that's in their armory. Well, until recently, I have focused on the last one, that this is a skill that should be in the teacher's armory. It should be an activity that the teacher can generate. But I now believe it should be in all areas, at every stage of the training chain for teachers, in every type of publication, and it's a new area of expert knowledge, a new area of teaching expertise that requires publications. Where should this teaching happen? Well, in main course textbooks. Let's consider an example of what we learn about the sound shape of the word spelt A-S-K-E-D. And I've taken this example from National Geographic uh, publication. Their, their wonderful keynote series. And this is an image from uh, Keynote Proficient. Pronunciation, consonant clusters. And this is the information about the sound shapes of these words. How do you think the underlined consonant clusters are pronounced? Discuss with a partner, then listen and check. So this is information about the sound substance of English. And let's hear the sound files. So we'll hear the sound files first at the speed given in the textbook recording and then slowed down. Asked. Asked. Ask me. Ask me. She asked. 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 And then I ask my students. I've asked them. So some textbooks, such as those in the Outcomes series by Hugh Diller and Andrew Walkley, contain a very useful feature, slow, manageable, careful speech, and then much faster versions of the same speech. So if we consider this um, clause in red, 
it goes and were sitting there crying and were sitting there crying so that's the slow careful version and this is the faster version and were sitting there crying and were sitting there crying sitting there sitting there sitting there so where should this teaching happen i believe it should be in all areas whenever all the time okay so it's a truth very little acknowledged by the ELT profession. All sounds and sibyls can be dropped, blurt or blended. In my work, I make use of the botanic metaphor of the greenhouse, the garden and the jungle. In the greenhouse, words are treated as if they're carefully nurtured, isolated, perfect forms with pauses between them and all segments lovingly recreated. So in the greenhouse, we would have, I never did it in college. And in the garden, um, flowers and plants are brought together in a pleasing arrangement and they touch each other gently as the breeze blows and makes them sway and come into contact with each other's edges. I never did it in college. But then we get the jungle form where we go beyond the rules of connected speech that we saw in the garden and we get uh, jungle forms such as I never did in college. I never did in college. I never did it in college. I never did it in college. So if we look at slightly more closely at the jungle version, um, we've got a five column display. And what we're interested in is the crushing and jungle forms that occur in between prominences. So these are jungle forms. I never did it in college. Did, did, tin has become din, din. I never did it in college. I never did it in college. So what you're looking at is um, something that I call the word crusher. And to learn about this, you will need to read my books. But very briefly, we have prominent syllables in columns four and two, and we have mush, particularly in columns three and five. And in this case, we've got vidin for Never did it. A key methodological thing that I encourage in teacher activities, teacher-led activities, is to do the botanic walk so that everybody in the class gets a feel through what I call vocal gymnastics of the relationship between the site-friendly greenhouse and garden and the jungle versions. So, led by the teacher, class should go did it in. Did it in, did in. I never did in college. Did it in, did it in. Similarly with um, very, very common uh, two part phrases. Be able. Be able, they will, got any, got any, gonny, to be able to live in, to be able to live in. Have you got any change? Have you got any change? So why the jungle? Because listening and pronunciation, the goals for mastery are different. Our goal as teachers is to help our learners understand fast, messy, authentic speech, which is much more varied and unpredictable than what they need to produce in order to be intelligible. You've got to get that point home. Now, that was a teacher armory device, but what if we could write a book such as my colleague, and other ELT professionals has written in the Cambridge University Press in use series. 
advanced grammar in use is um, one, for example, by, by Martin Hewings, which contains 50 or 60 units and um, a systematic approach to advanced grammar in this case. Well, what if we could write a book for listening decoding that was similar to that? What if we could do 50 or 60 units of material around listening decoding? And I'm going to demonstrate um, how you might do that using ideas from a, my book, A Syllabus for Listening Decoding. So in the proposed publication, Listening Decoding in Use, there would be these five sections, consonant death, foul play, streamlining effects, word clusters, and then a reference section. And here's a, a sample of um, the contents page, let's say, of um, how the consonant death section might look. So Martin Hewing's book and others in the In New series about how to get things right. But listening decoding in use is or would be about how to cope with an, with, with an infinity of wrongs committed by other people, the jungle. By other people, I mean expert speakers of English behaving normally. The jungle is other people. In the jungle, there are no rules. Nothing is right or wrong. So we have to practice breaking all the rules of careful, intelligible speaking in order to be comfortable with the realities of the mushy, messy, unruly everyday speech. So in the videos uh, which follow, we're going to treat consonant death, foul play, the polar risk and the hiss effect. So remember, I will keep on coming back to this. The goals for mastery are different for pronunciation and for listening. So when a textbook or a skills book instructs you, asked sounds like this or asked is pronounced asked. They're talking about the goal of pronunciation in the greenhouse and the garden. They should also tell you that asked has many sound shapes, including ast, axed, orst, esked, etc. I'm going to keep on hammering. The goals for mastery are different. So fast, messy, authentic speech. Our learners have got to become comfortable with it because it's much more varied and unpredictable than everything else we do in pronunciation and intelligible speech in English language teaching. So that's the end of the introduction. Thank you for listening, if you got this far. Um, there will be a handout and worksheets for later videos um, available on the website at the address shown. So this was the introduction. There are three more videos to come. Consonant death, the case of t. Polar risk, the case of can and can. And the hiss effect. S so one last word in this. So in these four videos, I'm demonstrating design ideas for a future publication. But as I'm retiring from active participation in ELT, I will be neither authoring nor publishing listening decoding in use. So if you work for a publisher who might be interested in buying the rights to this design, do encourage them to get in touch via my website.